environmental history around the world. I think one thing that, that I took away from it was the possibility of, of making unexpected comparisons. A roundtable discussion about the Second World Congress for Environmental History. I'm Sean Karaj, and you're listening to episode 44 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This past July, for five days, environmental historians from around the world convened in Guimarães, Portugal, for the Second World Congress for Environmental History. This is the main event for the International Consortium of Environmental History Organizations. It brings together scholars from nearly every corner of the globe every five years to share new research in the field and to think about environmental history from a global perspective. This year, several scholars from Canada attended the conference, as they did five years ago. They took the opportunity to learn from colleagues in other national fields, and they shared research findings from the Canadian context. There were dozens of panels, roundtables, big plenary lectures, and a poster session, so much that not one person could see it all. So to help me get a better sense of this conference, and to explore some of its main themes and trends, I spoke with a group of environmental historians from Canada and one from the UK about the Second World Congress for Environmental History. I'm Stephen Bocking at Trent University. I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm Matthew Evenden in the Department of Geography at the University of British Columbia. I'm Alexander Hall. I'm at Coventry University in England and previously a visiting scholar at York in Toronto. And I'm Tina Liu at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And if I've done my alphabetizing right, I'm John Thistle, and I am a research associate at the Labrador Institute of Memorial University. And I'm Jocelyn Thorpe, and I'm always last in alphabetical order to things. And I am at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and I'm in Women's and Gender Studies. So we have a very big group here today uh, representing a wide spectrum of environmental historians from across Canada and one outside of Canada. Alex is joining us from the UK. Is that right, Alex? Yep, yep, that's right. Um, And what ties us all together is that uh, uh, each of us uh, spent part of our summer in Portugal attending the World Congress for Environmental History's second meeting uh, in Guimarães, uh, uh, Portugal, in the northern part of the country, And I wanted to get everyone together to share some of their impressions of the conference uh, and what they took away from it. Um, So maybe I'll just start off and uh, I'll ask Stephen maybe to get us started, um, letting us know a little bit about what stood out to him as some of the most significant insights that he took away from the conference. Okay, thanks, Sean. Good question. Um, I think one thing that that I took away from it was the possibility of of making unexpected comparisons. Mm -hmm. That, like, uh, if I can mentioned my own, the session I gave my own paper, and I gave a paper on salmon aquaculture, and my, my time period that I focus on is late 20th century, early 21st century, and I never really looked much at medieval ac- aquaculture, but the other papers in the session were from medieval times, so it was organized by Richard Hoffman, and I learned a lot from the papers on that time period, that there's actually interesting comparisons between 16th century aquaculture and 20th century aquaculture, and so I, I didn't expect that, so it was a good thing to learn. Yeah, I noticed that in a lot of the sessions. I mean, obviously, this was a very broad international conference that had scholars from Europe, Latin America, North America, Australia, New Zealand, um, some East Asian scholars and some African scholars. Um, And you could see uh, a lot of um, both chronological intersections as well as uh, transnational intersections in terms of the topics that were covered. Tina, uh, what stood out for you? Um, Some of the same things. I was impressed by the expansive time scale that was dealt with at the conference um, for the same reason Stephen does. I think North American environmental history tends to be quite modern in its biases and emphases. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, of course, was the interdisciplinarity. Uh, One of the sessions, at least one of the sessions I went to, um, did a good job of incorporating archaeological evidence. In fact, none of the people on the panel was formally a historian, but they were all dealing with change over time. So I think interdisciplinarity was what stood out for me. John, what about you? What did, uh, what did you notice at the conference? There were so many sessions. 
there were so many sessions. So I guess this is uh, one thing to say is to preface this by saying it's a kind of a limited sample size for me. I mean, I took in as many as I could. Uh, but of course, uh, you can only ever do so much. I think for me, what I, what I took away from the conference maybe wasn't so much uh, an insight um, as a reminder. I mean, I agree with everything that Tina and Stephen have said so far. But for me, uh, there was a real powerful reminder of just how uh, attention to space and scale uh, shapes the sorts of stories that environmental historians and others tell about the past. And for me, this came up in a session on watersheds, which was all about this sort of thing. And there was this great paper which talked about a river in Italy, I think, if I, if I remember correctly, and how, you know, at first glance, this doesn't look like an industrialized river at all. And that's the way historians of that place have tended to treat it. But the moment you pulled back uh, and looked at the same river from a watershed perspective, um, suddenly uh, you, you saw that it, pr pretty much every tributary which ran into it was, in fact, altered in, in one way or another. Um, and so for me, that was just a, a reminder among maybe a lot of over the years that, you know, that the, the way we think about space and scale can really powerfully shape the the kinds of stories we tell. Uh, so that was something that stood out for me for sure. Well, that reminds me actually a little bit of Matthew's book on the Fraser River um, and the, the extent to which the main stem of the Fraser River was relatively unmodified, though, of course, there were some modifications on it. Matthew, what, uh, what sort of things did you take away from the conference? Well, I, I mean, I agree with all the things that have been said said already, I, I sample a whole range of different uh, sessions, and I, at this conference in particular, I deliberately try and get out of my comfort zone and see um, different international uh, sessions, so mm -hmm. I learn, learn a, a great deal by doing that, I think, hearing historians from South Asia talk to South Asian topics, say, or Chinese historians talk about Chinese topics is um, really, it's a unique possibility. but. I, I would say that the sessions that impressed me most at the conference were the ones uh, focused on the Columbian Exchange and, and revisiting the ecological imperialism narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. These are ones with Judith Carney and some of her colleagues, and uh, they were well organized. They, they fed off of one another. Um, they revisited a core story and problem in environmental history, and I just felt uh, it was so refreshing, and I felt like I was brought up to date with the latest research on some of these uh, uh, questions that have fascinated me throughout my whole career. So uh, it was a, these sessions were, for me, uh, provide a lot of insight, but also I mean, models for what can happen at a World Congress meeting, uh, drawing colleagues from across the world. And, and like Tina said, it was very interdisciplinary, too. I mean, there was a botanist in one of the sessions um, <clears throat> talking about uh, different strains of rice that she's uh, discovered in uh, uh, peripheral areas of Suriname, which correspond to some of the uh, interpretations that Judith Carney came to earlier in her book on black rice. It was just a fascinating discussion. Yeah, I was at that session as well. And uh, I should say for any non-environmental historians listening to this episode, a botanist at a conference talking about rice is indeed exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, as a graduate student, what were your impressions? Was This was your first World Congress. It was, yes. Um, I noticed many of the things that other people have been mentioning. And uh, another thing that I, I noticed was that a lot of the panels that I went to nicely connected their topics to present-day issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just blown away with um, just how, how clearly em environmental issues re are reflected in the past. And um, environmental history seems like a, a field that that does that nicely, more so than other fields. Other conferences that I go to, uh, the people will say will have a story, and it's a nice story. But it's it's like, okay, so why why do we care about this? And I find that environmental history allows us to to figure out why we care and to to illustrate that more effectively. Jocelyn, um, did you find something similar? This is so interesting. Um, I was settling down into listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have to talk. Hmm. So, yeah, what struck me um, it was also sort of notions of, of disciplines. Um, and I think it speaks also to the kind of so what and, and who cares. Um, but to me, it made me think in a way about the ways in which we are disciplined. Um, 
more than the ways in which the conference was interdisciplinary. And, and maybe that speaks to um, uh, what it was that I was looking for or hoping for. And so I was struck by um, maybe more of an absence of uh, Indigenous scholars and sort of environmentally mm-hmm. justice-focused scholars who um, whose maybe main focus is the contemporary era, but who are always drawing on history in order to make sense of the contemporary kind of situation. Um, and so I thought a lot about how it is that we frame what it is that we're doing, shapes who it is who um, feels compelled to come to a conference and um, and who, I guess, sees sees themselves there. So I find it really interesting to think about that in terms of, you know, archaeologists and botanists coming. Um, so how might we, I guess, broaden that interdisciplinarity, um, maybe, I don't know, even by calling it something different. Like, how does what you call a conference shape who it is who comes and, and how it is that the research is framed? Mm-hmm. And Alex, uh, you're you're bringing us a perspective from the history of science as well as a perspective uh, from history outside of Canada. Uh, what stood out to you from the Second World Congress? Um, yeah, I think echoing a lot of the things people have already said. I think, I mean, one of the nicest things for me, um, the theme of the con- official theme of the conference, environmental history in the making. And so often uh, conferences have a theme or a, a subheading to them and you go and you can't really see how or why panels are, um, are about that, that, that element. And it was great to see so many sessions addressing methodological issues, theoretical aspects of discipline, um, not just seeing session after session on individual case studies, but seeing a lot more synthesis across cases. Um, so I think that was the main thing for me, which is kind of echoing really what other people have said. So I have another maybe more difficult question. When I go to the ASEH um, or a conference like this, one of the things I'm interested in seeing is what, uh, what are the new trends uh, in the field. Um, did anything stand out to uh, any of you on the panel uh, who wants to jump in as a new trend in scholarship and environmental history? Um, I'll, I'll say a word about that. This is, this is Stephen again. Um, uh, one thing that really struck me, and I, I wrote about this at the at the time, and I wrote a post about this, was just I was really impressed by the sophisticated analysis of science and knowledge in so many of the sessions at the conference. That uh, you know, um, been to past ASCHs, uh, ASCH conferences, and found that well, you know, the, the analysis of science can often tend towards to being fairly naive, but here it was really sophisticated in terms of examining carefully how, uh, how knowledge is constructed and how the authority of knowledge is formed, uh, the relations between science and how landscapes are perceived or how the different interests uh, conflict over uses of the landscape and those kinds of things, how, how knowledge is, is used as a political tool, those kinds of things about, about uh, you know, that uh, STS scholars and historians of science think about, that they were really being analyzed on a critical level by environmental historians. So I was really impressed by that. Sean, can I just jump in on that? Yeah, of course. I think I went to the wrong sessions. I wish that I'd gone <laughs> to the sessions that Stephen, Stephen's just mentioned, because I want to pick up what, what Jocelyn said, because she, in fa- she and I, in fact, have had a conversation about that absence, because what struck me, and I wonder if this is a trend, uh, is was a trend in in uh, the field, but maybe a difference between European and North American historiographies, Mm -hmm. is the absence of an explicit discussion about power. And I think for me, it started with the plenary address in which there was a discussion of poverty kind of in the absence of the, the necessary structural changes that would have to be implemented in order to create sustainability. It was it was it just struck me as odd and this reverberated through many of the sessions that i went to and i i wondered about how environmental historians in different parts of the world working on different case studies addressed questions of power because for me questions of gender and race and class the the kind of conventional ways we think about how power was manifested um were kind of absent and I'm 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 intrigued by what Stephen said because it seems to me in the sessions that dealt more explicitly with history of science that was not the case. 
And this is something I think that's come up at uh, meetings of the American Society for Environmental History, uh, questions about as Tina suggested, the sort of staples of social history not necessarily being as evident in environmental history analysis. Um, I I suppose it touches a little bit on what Stephen was suggesting, but Stephen, it sounds like you were seeing a lot more of the integration of the literature from the history of science appearing at this conference? Yeah, definitely. I think that I I saw at least people integrating ideas about uh, science as a social construction, um, science as, as a social activity, more so than um, I remember being the norm at other environmental history conferences I've been to. Mm-hmm. And of yes. course, this is also a function of what panels that we saw. Matthew mentioned mm-hmm. these sessions on the Columbian Exchange and Judith Carney's work. And I think there you see some of the most direct um, uh, blending of uh, discussions of power and the environment. Uh, it was Alex was going to, oh. I was just going to jump in and sort of um, echo some of the things Stephen said, I think, and not necessarily discussions of power particularly, but um uh, integration of of some of the fields or subdisciplines and areas um i saw a couple of great panels that uh, were on areas of his, history of science um and maybe didn't focus on power structures as much but possibly because some of the people speaking i think maybe do that in other arenas and kind of brought the environment mm-hmm. to the center of their of their papers at these sessions um and i found i found some interesting ones in that area but i also found some interesting sort of crossover with um, some historical geography sort of aspects, um, some interesting ways of looking at landscapes and changes, uh, not just over time, but also spatial changes. Um, and so I found some quite interesting overlaps at the World Congress that I, I'm not necessarily seeing at other environmental history conferences, especially with the history of science areas and STS, but also a little bit with the historical geographers as well. Hi, this is John here. May I pipe in on this point? Yeah, of course. Um, I agree with a lot of what's being said, uh, especially, Tina, your points. Um, It seemed to me that um, as regards this issue of science and also, I guess, to some extent, interdisciplinarity, it struck me, and again, this may just reflect the kinds of sessions I ended up in, right? But it it struck me that there's still a bit of a a two cultures thing going on with some people using science to understand the past and and others who were more interested in approaching uh, questions of science and nature from a science studies perspective, but not a ton of work on what, you know, is sort of the middle ground of those positions. And I mean, I think of Tina's paper, for example, on changing uh, northern caribou populations and the roots of co-management and I think what you called uh, post-normal science, Tina. Um, and, and how it was seeking to, you know, really grapple seriously with with a lot of issues, power among them, but also what's happening with the caribou population. Uh, but most of the papers uh, that that I saw treated science either as one thing or the other, right? There there wasn't there weren't the kinds of papers that said, okay, look, science is potentially a powerful uh, means of understanding the environmental past, but also it is something that needs to be understood historically. Uh, as the product of, you know, intertwined social and environmental context. In other words, the kinds of stuff that science and, stud- uh, science and technology scholars have been pointing out for years. And, and again, I think this also reflects probably my own preoccupations, too, because I, I am admittedly quite interested in, you know, studies that, that use science to understand the environmental past, but, but are also really careful about how they do it and are careful to contextualize that science to expose some of its power relations and the different ways in which it's socially produced. I'll let oh, Jessica ahead. jump in. She's a, okay. she's a new graduate student. She's on the bleeding yeah. edge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what trends are you uh, introducing and leading in the field, Jessica? <laughs> what am I? Oh, man. Well, um, I, w- I was kind of surprised how little digital history was represented um, because it seems to be such a hot topic and, uh, and so popular on the internet and whatnot. But very few... Uh, papers that I saw uh, interwove anything to do with it, um, <clears throat> and to go with the 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 science part of things, and also uh, I think it is a, a cultural thing that Europeans tend to use more qualitative, I mean quantitative re- research, and sometimes there's a bit of a narrative lacking. And I think that is a bit of a disconnect between the two academic cultures. And and also, while we celebrate interdisciplinarianism, when we have botanists and and other science related folks coming into the to the the playing field, they may not have the same understanding of 
presenting the past that more narrative based historians do. So yeah, it's an interesting yeah. point. I had kind of expected to uh, be bombarded with a lot of HGIS projects, and there were mm-hmm. certainly some that were presented, um, um, but that definitely was not a, a an overwhelming tool that was being used. Um, mm-hmm. But you can see its 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 development or its emergence in in a variety of different national fields. Matthew, you wanted to take us in a bit of a different direction. Yeah, I, I mean, I it's, it's interesting to hear the different perspectives. I mean, we, it it all comes from the fact that we were in different sessions. I was in fewer of the history of science sessions, so I wasn't struck by either Stephen or, or Tina's point so much. Though I I think following Jessica's, um, I did sense a kind of uh, distinction between the North American environmental historians and and European and other environmental historians, and I wonder if there's just a little bit more of interest in North America in kind of cultural histories of nature approaches as opposed to uh, elsewhere. The the other thing that really struck me while I was there, though, was the different kinds of research programs and training models that operate in other places that produce different kinds of research. I mean, I noticed a range of papers, for example, coming out of research groups in Austria on work on uh, changing histories of the soil and of the River Danube. But there was a big group from the United Kingdom working on water and river and power issues. Um, there's just a, a very different structuring of graduate education and it produces a different kind of, of research and, and discussion. And it was the, the, the really nice part of it, uh, I thought, was that there was a series of kind of linked papers that you could really dig into and get a sense of the, the broader project. But it was quite a different style to the way in which graduate education works in most North American universities. And and so I was struck there by the, the differences that come out at an international conference because of those different institutional backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I noticed something similar. I was at the session on the, uh, the Tua River um, in northern Portugal. And again, it was one of these um, multi-scholar collaborative projects and interdisciplinary projects as well, where a historian, um, scientists, and social scientists were each taking slices of a study of a particular place. Um, so as Matthew suggested, it's a different kind of approach to environmental history than what we're accustomed to seeing in Canada and the United States, perhaps. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. I, I would just make the distinction between uh, how uh, history is conducted within Canada between Anglophone historians and one situated in Quebec, because I think mm. the team, the equipe model, is more dominant there. and You really do see those differences, and it extends from students to how faculty members work. I mean, there's much more collaborative teamwork uh, mm-hmm. with in um, Quebec universities than there would yeah, be true. in Anglophone universities. Yeah, if I could bump in, uh, my supervisor's project, Sustainable Farm Systems, um, had the five panels with teams mm-hmm. from Austria and Spain, and uh, a lot of I got I have the chance to get to know a lot of the grad students from those teams and. Uh, the way that they go about their graduate training is absolutely completely different and they can't you tell them about our comprehensive exams uh, schedule and they they're just blown away by it and they can't believe that you know they're expected to, to start publishing within their first year and there's a point there's a point system that they have to reach and um, it really affects the work that they they can do because they have to be meeting these quotas. <clears throat> well, maybe if I can uh, interject here and uh, shift gears to think a little bit about what the benefits uh, there are to engaging with uh, it, an international literature. Um, what benefits do Canadian environmental historians get from uh, going to a conference like this or environmental historians from other national fields? What's the benefit for environmental history of engagement with a, an international literature? This is Matthew speaking. I, I think that the basic thing is it gets us out of a North American bubble and it shakes us up and, and puts some of our questions in a, a comparative context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. It uh, really breaks down any assumptions anybody might have about Canadian exceptionalism. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that there's a, the Canadians relate to nature, the environment, the landscape in particular interesting ways uh, um, that uh, people in other countries value and uh, their landscape in 
equally in as equally complex ways as Canadians do that kind of thing. Um, it's Alex again. I, I think for me, kind of, I'm in an interesting position somewhere in the middle, and it, it works in two directions, I guess, for me. Um, I think I always enjoy, um, from a UK perspective, uh, the international conferences, um, because I think in the UK, especially environmental histories, are a less sort of distinct <coughs> discipline. There's a lot of people working in other departments, different roles, working in geography departments, uh, bigger history departments. Um, different job titles necessarily and it's good to see sort of the international national perspective and often I think in the UK there's um, maybe a mainstream view that um, the environment has been manipulated for so long that some of the ideas that were at the core of the emergence of environmental history in North America aren't there you know concepts such as wilderness um, aren't really prevalent in the sort of UK narrative so it's always interesting to sort of put the UK work and British research into those those kind of contexts um, but then having spent a lot of time in Canada as well, um, I kind of see things from that, the perspective of research there as well. And I, I think I echo everyone there. It's just, it's just great to see um, different regions and approaches in different regions. Um, and especially as each continent or region has had very distinct um, environmental histories and very individual progress. Yeah, I mean, certainly for me, um, seeing case studies from a variety of different parts of the world really underlines uh, an opportunity to think about Canada's environmental history as part of a, an environmental history of the Earth, um, and where we can see human beings across the geographic spectrum and the chronological spectrum encountering, in some cases, common problems, in some cases, idiosyncratic problems, and in some cases, problems that, of course, cross borders um, or at least are happening simultaneously on different parts of the globe. Um, so in some ways, I mean, it's it's the point that Stephen raised, that it... Uh, helps us to see what is and what isn't exceptional about, about Canada's environmental history. But in other ways, I thought it was a great opportunity to see uh, an environmental history of humanity um, that, uh, didn't, that wasn't restricted by national borders. And in particular, the session on locusts really stood out as an excellent example of uh, a theme that tied uh, three papers across three different time periods in three different geographic areas. I think it was uh, Germany, Australia, and um, the border between the Soviet Union and Iran from the 18th century up to the 20th century. Wow. I should have gone. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alex was there. <laughs> yeah, it was a great panel. Um, yeah, I was. Um, that that was a great panel. I think, like you say, Sean, for sort of highlighting how something that you know we've already raised. Um, you know, different time periods could couldn't we wouldn't usually think in our own sort of entrenched views of comparing necessarily across those kind of time scales, and then also um, globally as well, um, showing these recurrent problems and using. Um, a physical, um, well, a species in this instance, but in a lot of other panels uh, instances, a physical example that ties all of those different disparate things together. Right. I mean, there were panels that used rivers as the the uh, the uh, linking theme between the uh, the papers or cities um, or uh, in the case of the the locust ones, uh, an insect. Um, well, what did, what did Canada bring to this conference? What what contribution does Canada make to global environmental history? Uh, did anybody get a sense that uh, there was some Canadian purpose? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jocelyn, I'll, I'll um, let you jump in here and give us some of your thoughts on uh, Canada's place at uh, the World Congress for Environmental History. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Sean. I'm just thinking about... Um, the kind of seemingly contradictory role that we have where um, about exceptionalism, uh, Stephen, as you were saying, where often we have to say in doing our work, you know, this is what makes it distinct. This is what makes it unique. And then the trouble of containing it, because often you find, you know, exactly the opposite. Oh, actually, it's not so unique. But you can't really say that, you know, because then it's hard to say, it, and this is why it's important. Right. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking of is a part in one of the um, end plenaries that I found pretty shocking um, that was about the, you know, what does Europe have to offer environmental history? And uh, the person who was speaking said, well, you know, Europe has a deep past and, uh, and North America doesn't, you know, and 
um, it, like it was really hard for me not to stand up and just go ah! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't maybe because you were holding my hand Sean um, but I guess so it goes both ways like I, th- I think that then what we quote unquote have to offer here then is to say well actually we need to look at the deep past of North America and perhaps that means that we're not looking at the history of white people but you know it doesn't make it any less historical um, and so, yeah, so I guess when it comes to that, it, to me, it seems like those conversations are the things that are necessary, even as I think they fly in the face of any kind of exceptionalism, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a great yeah. example, right? I mean, that's uh, the one thing I, I, I noticed was, you know, Canadians at, at this conference brought with them the things that we tend to focus on in our scholarship. Um, and in particular, Aboriginal history is something that I think that stands out in, in the Canadian literature that doesn't perhaps stand out in literatures in other national fields, even in the United States. Um, and another one that stands out to me, always stands out to me for environmental history in Canada is hydroelectricity. We're obsessed with it. Um, and so I think we always stand out at these kind of conferences talking about energy, uh, particularly hydroelectricity. Yeah, and I guess then just to follow up quickly, I think... Um, in pointing out those things that can't be ignored in the places that we're from, wherever they are, then perhaps it asks other people, and including us, what it is that can't be ignored in those other places shouldn't also be ignored in these places. So, you know, the history of colonialism, well, certainly maybe it can be ignored in British uh, environmental history, but why is that, right? So it asks us to ask those bigger questions. Um, Right, and that question came up too in the context of um, the interconnections between Australia, New Zealand, and Canadian environmental history. And someone asked why we wouldn't ask those questions about the interconnections of British colonialism for U.S. environmental history as well. Yeah, yeah, and why even the groupings of it. Again, you see the ways in which we're disciplined in our thinking by the way things are structured. So in that last plenary when they had, you know, what are the groups of envir- global or world environmental history, and there was Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, I forget about South Africa, and then the United States was its own thing, you know, as if that didn't have a similar kind of history of, of imperialism and, and white settlement. So anyway, it was, it was so interesting, that, that kind of tension. Jocelyn's comments just made me, this is Matthew, uh, think of something. I, I, my impression was that Canadian papers were quite dispersed across the conference. And uh, I think that we probably have less of an impact than we would like in the discussions. Um, this is partly due to the usual problem of generating international interest in Canada, but also because I think our efforts are dispersed and there are a lot of good things that come from that. Uh, uh, kind of diffusion and different questions being asked in different places and so on. But I wonder if before, and this is jumping to a later topic maybe, but I wonder if before the next World Congress, we've identified various things that we we wished we had seen or, or questions that uh, occur in Canada but don't occur in other national historiographies, if we should get organized and... Um, hold some kind of workshop in advance, a year in advance, to think up some really good session ideas, which wouldn't just involve Canadians, but which would launch Canadian work in purposeful ways into the international discussion, so that our efforts are a little less diffuse, a little less uh, oriented towards our individual research programs, but try strategically to engage international colleagues in in ways that Canadian work can help to move the whole field forward. That's quite an interesting idea. I know there was an effort uh, to have Canadian papers spread uh, across panels mixed within um, papers in other national fields, certainly, but this idea of at least trying to coordinate those from are you suggesting like a Canadian perspective or at least having some way of influencing those transnational sessions? Well, no, I mean, we know, we know how these things n- normally happen. Everybody scrambles the last minute to get their sessions <laughs> together, their individual papers together. Mm-hmm. What, if we, what if we did it a little earlier and thought hard about uh, international colleagues we'd like to connect with in some theme sessions or um, strategic ways of bringing Canadian topics into the international discussion? I mean, if we have in- 
uh, uh, Canada focus sessions, there's always a risk that international colleagues won't come. Mm-hmm. If we have Canadian papers seeded into thematic sessions, there are other risks that come from that. So I'm just wondering if there might be a point in uh, having a discussion amongst the group that's planning to go in a rough general way. People don't have to participate if they don't want to, but to think strategically about how to engage better. John, Tina, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I like, I like that idea, the idea that Matthew had. I would maybe just throw this idea in, and um, I think that we might spend some time profitably thinking not just about topics and international colleagues we'd like to connect with in relation to those topics, but to think about questions. And I go back, questions that we all approach the field from, and that way we could see perhaps what Canada has to bring, but we could also see the diversity of approaches to a particular set of questions. So go back to um, Stephen and John's comments about history of science, how, and the construction of knowledge. Um, how, what does the construction of environmental knowledges look like, and what kinds of ideological and political work does it perform in a variety of contexts? There's a number of scholars who are working on that subject from a number of places, both temporally and geographically. So thinking in terms of questions might be a useful way to go about bringing people together. Well, this is is a kind of nice segue into what I wanted to ask uh, the group about what other things they want to see in future WCEH events. The next uh, Congress will be five years from now. Um, what would you want to see added or changed? Uh, can I jump in, Sean? This yeah. is John. Um, so let me just preface this by saying I'm not very uh, technologically adept. And uh, so so this, this proposal uh, might seem impossible to people who are technologically adept. Uh, adept. I think it would be good if uh, conferences like this could be webcast somehow for people who can't afford to go um, or who for whatever reason can't make it. Um, it this, this came up a lot actually in different in the hallways uh, at, at this conference but also in some of the larger uh, settings where people spoke on different topics. There, I mean there are a lot of people who just can't make it to these conferences for, for a lot of really good reasons. Um, I mean, some of which are to do with language. It's an English language conference. Others of which are to do with the cost and, and distances involved. And I just wondered if I'm, this is probably a partial uh, solution to the problem. At, but I wonder if it would be possible to have have a situation whereby you know you could still sign up for the conference and in a sense virtually go to the sessions you're interested in. Maybe that's a huge technological undertaking or at least an administrative one. But I, I think it would be kind of interesting to look at. I think. Um I think you kind of took some of the words out of my mouth there. I think, um, well, two two things you touched upon. The, the technology development, I think, for me, um, I was involved a lot with the International Conference for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine in 2013. And and I I really worked with them to try and, to try and do some of these uh, in, uh, online link-ups, um, albeit in an experimental way. And we, we successfully managed to stream a couple of sessions. Not every session, nowhere near that. But we, we successfully managed to live stream a few sessions that we knew had um, international interest from people who couldn't attend in person. Um, and there were some barriers we found, but there's definitely ways that as the technology improves as well, that the, um, we managed to get around some of the official costs that come from conference centers for those kind of technologies um, and, and tried to do it ourselves a little bit. Um, and they, they had some reasonable success. Um, and I think the other thing for me also linked to that is... Um, is sort of the, the language barriers that might exist for an international conference mm-hmm. that is is only conducted in in one language. Um, I wondered whether there is a, a way of having an official second language or an official you know few languages that at least maybe um, abstracts could be translated into or submitted in, um, or whether some panels could be totally uh, given in those languages. Um, I, I know that then that has problems of who will attend that panel. Um, obviously comes up, but it, it tries to make it a little bit more inclusive, at least at the application stage. Yes. Uh, yeah. D- Jocelyn, any other uh, uh, suggestions for changes to the conference? Well, I thought there was an interesting discussion at the end of the conference about a uh, physical location of a conference. Um, and there seemed to be kind of a, a big push to have the next 
uh, Environmental History Congress somewhere in the global south also seemed to be a bit of a tension about where that would be specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, in terms of who goes and who can travel and, and all the things that we've been talking about too related to institutional support of research, um, I think, it, I mean, it changes when you have it somewhere else. So I think, yeah, I think I would really like to see this conference happening, whether it's in Rio or somewhere, anywhere, anywhere else. I think what were the two contenders? I don't know, maybe that's contentious. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, just that I think that that kind of stuff that then in terms of languages spoken, um, uh, people who can afford to go depending on how close or far it is, and also other kind of big things like um, uh, subsidizing different, um, you know, flights from different places. Um, it just might all be really useful to think about and consider as um, we think about who it is that we hope to be having conversations with, um, which I think also connects to Tina's point about, you know, and Matthew's too, about asking questions, asking them early, and then thinking ahead, oh, okay, so who is asking these kind of questions? And then can we get these people together? And then can we get them to go somewhere all together um, and get to have those conversations in person? Which, not that I don't like the live streaming, I just mm-hmm. find there's nothing that replaces that actual human to human being in the same place and then getting to go swimming afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it kind of fun. So I thought you cool, Jocelyn. Is that a vote for <laughs> is that's a vote for Rio, I assume then. Maybe. That that Portugal <laughs> hotel and pool was pretty great. <laughs> I was there. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I guess I guess this is an obvious thing to say, but it speaks to uh, Alex's and others' point about about streaming and about at least trying on a nominal basis, at least or an experimental basis, to include people uh, at a distance. Is is that we are an environmental history conference? We have a giant footprint when we fly uh, to from afar to get to these places. So it seems to me there's a an inherent contradiction. Um, that we can't ever entirely address because I agree with Jocelyn that there's nothing like the face to face, but, um, you know, we could at least perhaps have panels where one panelist came in via, uh, uh, an equivalent of Skype and there are all kinds of equivalents, uh, that are better than Skype, uh, which universities have. My own university uses something called blue jeans, for instance, and I was just on a PhD defense for that and it worked swimmingly well through an internet browser. So, I would be supportive of thinking environmental terms as well as intellectual ones and in terms of language and power. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that the possibility for streaming sessions is five years from now is going to be quite likely. Um, At my own university, we've got several classrooms now equipped with multi-camera, multi-recording equipment to live stream lectures for classes. Um, so it would just, I think, be a matter of having that kind of infrastructure available wherever the conference is being held. One thought I've had is that uh, this conference, most conferences in environmental history are quite conservative in terms of their format. I mean, we have roundtables or there are paper sessions. And I wonder if, I mean, and many people will need to continue doing that to justify uh, attending a conference like this, but I wonder if we can't borrow from other disciplines and think of say, a working group model within uh, the conference, or at least some times in the program that are uh, devoted to breakout sessions around particular themes or problems in international environmental history. I don't know about, I mean, uh, uh, reference to swimming pools, I was going to bring up uh, small cups of espresso. That's where I had some of the liveliest uh, discussions was after sessions in those uh, brief minutes between when everyone was mm-hmm. quaffing down Portuguese pastries and um, espresso. And uh, that's where things were sh- shaken up a bit and you had a chance to mix and, and talk and really explore things with mm-hmm. people. And if there's some structured way to make that happen beyond the kind of uh, desperate rush over coffee, um, it might be worth thinking about. Yeah, those coffee sessions were beautifully orchestrated at the conference. I should, I want to highlight that as a real 
uh, a real uh, plus at that conference. <laughs> there was one uh, experimental format session, I think, that the organizers obviously um, were behind, and it was the poster presentation session. So rather than just right. having the posters um, up in a hallway somewhere or in a room, um, which they did, they, in addition to that, uh, booked a large auditorium and had the poster uh, session there as well, and people in a I think two or three minutes presented very quickly an abstract of each of the posters so that if you weren't able to browse the posters, you could in one sitting see them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah I thought that worked very well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the only suggestion that I would make on, on something to add to the conference is to think a little bit more about the conference legacy. There was some effort to uh, raise money to support um, the study of environmental history uh, in uh, Guimarães uh, um, and some fundraising that was done at the conference. And so I'd like to see that kind of legacy uh, of the conference um, continue, but also the legacy of the papers as well. I was pleased to see that a publisher uh, stepped forward to publish proceedings from the conference, but I wonder what kind of additional post-conference outcomes we can imagine um, for the WCEH five years from now. Um, this is Stephen again. My thought has always been that uh, kind of the outcomes of a conference like this, that uh, the main outcomes are not necessarily ones formally organized in connection with the conference itself, but mm. just come out of it. Like certain panels, I imagine, I think they were getting together to organize theme issues of journals or the papers were just, uh, you know, important <clears throat> stepping stones towards finishing a project and will appear as a paper or a book somewhere. So mm -hmm. the, the results of the conference are going to be disseminated through dozens of informal channels. And I, I, would, I would think that maybe that would be uh, the best way to proceed, kind of in an unorganized or maybe self-organizing way rather than having, say, proceedings of the entire conference mm. that just sit on the shelf. So maybe it just needs a little bit more espresso time to help uh, exactly. foster those those exactly. connections. Yes, that's right. That's what I wanted to say. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, taking a little bit of time to reminisce about this uh, pretty incredible conference that uh, each of us attended uh, this past summer. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Matthew, Jocelyn, and Alex. Thank Thanks, you, Sean. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sean. Thank you. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Stephen Bocking, Matthew Evenden, Jessica DeWitt, Alex Hall, Tina Liu, John Thistle, Jocelyn Thorpe, and me, Sean Courage. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. For details on the artists, please take a look at our show notes page at niche-canada.org slash naturespast, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and leave us comments. Please let us know what you think about the podcast, and don't forget to rate and review this podcast on our iTunes page. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash naturespast. You can always get the latest information on events in the environmental history community from the Niche website at niche-canada.org, and you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next month with another episode of Nature's Past.